Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I am committed to bringing to you guests who will both inspire and challenge you. And my guest today will certainly be doing that. If you enjoy my podcast, I encourage you and invite you to uh, write a review and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. And my podcast is brought to you by my company, Performance Support Systems. We publish software tools and books for improving the way people communicate with each other at work. And you can learn more at growstrongleaders.com. Today, I'm really excited to welcome as my guest, Dr. Doreen Downing. Doreen, welcome to my show. Oh, Meredith, I've been looking forward to it. I know we talked a couple months ago and you have so many guests that it was uh, took a while to get here, but I'm glad today I get to be in conversation with you. I am too. Doreen is one of these very special people. You will notice it when we're talking. Uh, Doreen, I don't think I've ever even told you what a calming voice you have. And of course, that is a result of your uh, training because Doreen is a psychologist and she's also the founder of the Essential Speaking Institute. She's the host of the podcast, Find Your Voice, Change Your Life, where I've had the honor of being her guest. And what's interesting is despite all of her professional accomplishments, Doreen once suffered from stage fright. And in conquering it, she discovered that being connected to your authentic self, so key, is the key to relaxed and confident speaking. And so she now specializes in helping clients overcome their anxiety around public speaking. And in addition to her coaching and online courses, Doreen is the author of Essential Speaking, The Seven-Step Guide to Finding Your Real Voice, a book that teaches you how to transform your anxiety with presence and connection. Doreen, I love all of those words uh, that relate to your work and what you do. And I think before we get into having you share some of the insights and tips and just help that you provide to your clients. I would love for you to tell us more about your own journey. Where did your own stage fright come from and how did you work through that? Hmm, That's a great question to start with, Meredith. I would say that in any, any coaching client that comes to me, I always get curious, just that same question, where did it come from? And I think that a lot of people do have curiosity about that because they're adults and they should be able to speak. And why is it such a problem? So I go first to childhood memories. (laughs) And well, that's because I'm a psychologist. And I would say in my situation, I have several memories that I think are roots to my anxiety about showing up in public. The first one that I've identified for myself when I did the deep dive into self-discovery was that my grandmother would always shut my sister and myself up because mother was sick. She had depression. So if we made noise, grandma said, if we made noise, mom was going to go back to the hospital. And so of course, early on, I, I contained my energy, my bright spirit, my little girl, hello world, you know, just had to, Ooh, I've got to be quiet. I've got to be. So very early in life, I learned to be very uh, withheld in terms of what I, whenever I speak up. I have other moments, but I think that's, it gives your listeners Mm -hmm. a sense of what I like to do first around discovering some of the roots of where your little, little girl, little boy, little guy coming out into the world. And are you welcomed or are you shut down? Did an older sibling 
a bully you? Was it a school situation? Was it a teacher? Was it also maybe cultural, you know, or maybe just in some ways, children are to be seen, not heard. So there's all sorts of ways in which we learn early on, is it okay for us to speak up? And that's what I do first is to uncover the roots of anxiety. You know, I have to think that's, that's challenging at times, because I remember when I was on your show thinking about, you know, what had happened with me. And often I think we want to repress or dismiss some of these things that have happened to us in the past or minimize them and say, well, that, you know, wasn't that important. And yet what a profound impact it can have on our psyches and the stories we continue telling ourselves about our voice from a very young age. I'm curious, because uh, I am curious too. I love your word, the use of curious. Um, how your training as a psychologist has helped you in your role with the work you're doing with clients now on finding their voice? Well, I think that's why people come to me because they realize it's more than Toastmasters. And Toastmasters is great. You can learn to write a speech and deliver it and with all sorts of vocal variety and uh, emphasis and really powerful words, of course. But I know that even though I did Toastmasters for years, I still had a fear that was lodged way down deep inside of me. And so that's who I work with, people who know that there's something other than just perfecting their communication skills. And so as the, well, my training as a psychologist is about going very slowly, but very deliberately and very gently. So like if, you know, any kind of animal that's been wounded, uh, you want to approach in a non-threatening way. And I think when you commented earlier about my, my way of being is calming, I think that that's Partly what I love about the work that I do is I, I create a safe learning environment for people to go to places they don't want to go or they think, like you said, that they dismiss it or minimize it, that they don't think that it has a lot of value, but deep down they know that something happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and one last thing about this is that even though some, I'm just going to put quotes around something, air quotes, I guess even though something didn't happen, maybe like an introvert didn't get enough airtime. They just kind of said, oh, I'm an introvert. I'll just, um, and I'm not good at speaking. So, uh, so they didn't get enough kind of permission to take the spotlight. So it's not so much that something negative happened, but just circumstances of life created, I think, some patterns and so that's what I do first is to identify the patterns. And then I do pattern interrupt, which is a lot of the psychological work that I bring to let's 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 interrupt those patterns and get to the mm -hmm. real you, the, mm -hmm. essence of, the essence of who you are, the authentic you that's deep down inside. Well, and I love your emphasis on that word authentic, because I think sometimes we think we're being authentic. You know, we don't necessarily feel like a, a phony or like we're because we're not lying. Right. And yet there are parts of ourselves that we've compartmentalized or maybe hiding. And I think I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about what are some of the fears that you see, you know, being behind what holds people back? from speaking up. And I think it's important for my listeners to realize you're helping people not just with public speaking, that's one arena, but even speaking up in meetings, speaking up in different situations that they might feel are risky, right? I mean, I think it's got application for all these different scenarios. Absolutely. And I do not necessarily work at all with people who want to get up on a stage and be public speakers. There are so many good coaches for that. But I work with people who may have to get up on a stage and who are terrified to do that. And I can help them get over their anxiety. 
as well as all the other circumstances in which we are speaking all day long. I mean, you may run into a coworker in the hall, maybe a, somebody else who's working on a project that you are working on and you want to share an idea, but maybe you think that that idea is going to be dismissed and they're going to laugh at you or they're going to put it down right away. So you hold it back. There are all sorts of speaking opportunities throughout the day where you need to be connected to yourself and I call it the core, the core inside of you, I call it the essence, but the core of you that feels like he, she knows what she's talking about and can show up in any conversation, a meeting, stay. So, yeah, so let's look at what are the things that block them, you know, from being able to, to that causes them to be disconnected in the first place. The cause that has them be disconnected first is what we were talking about. There's something about self-concept that didn't really get flourishing early enough. And then there's patterns that get in place and with time, anxiety sets in and then some self-concept. Oh, I'm just not good. Or, you know, I'm not somebody who uh, can offer an opinion at this meeting. Other people have better ideas or people are going to laugh at me. There's just so many ways in which the mind plays these tricks. And I, I know you know the phrase self-limiting. We limit ourselves with the thoughts that we have. So uh, the kind of fear that you asked about a second ago, it's, I think, bottom line, if we just, we could, we could name it in all sorts of ways, but let's just call it what it is, judgment. We're afraid of being judged. And in fact, we carry that judge inside of ourselves all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that part of the work is to confront the negative self-limiting thoughts that are coming from that inner critic, that inner judge. Yes, it's so important. And I was just thinking first for the Folks that come to you that just have this so this judgmental of themselves and therefore intolerant of others, because what I have found is when I am feeling the most intolerant of someone else, it's usually something that's going on with me, right? <laughs> that that uh, I'm something I'm not dealing with that is causing me to now think something's wrong with everybody else. And so when you've got someone that you're working with that has these, you know, really strongly ingrained patterns. What have you found to be, I'm just thinking of listeners who may want to identify their own patterns and kind of break, take a break uh, fr free from them. What would you recommend or what do you do with a client th that has these deeply ingrained self-critical thoughts and stories? First, I listen. <laughs> I first to draw it out of them, I ask, I, I start with an initial assessment, you know, like what is your, what are the most challenging situations and what are your thoughts about it? So I get them to share what their thoughts are. What are they afraid of? And are they afraid that they aren't going to make sense? Are they afraid that uh, they are going to be made fun of? Are they afraid that people are going to walk out? Are they afraid the authorities in the room are going to um, what, uh, not give them the raise that they need or that they want. So there are all sorts of consequences uh, when you start thinking about, oh, what ifs. So what I do is help people look at the what if. What if, you know, that was really true that the, um, let's say your boss is in the room and you've got, you're terrified of the authority figure and you're your raise depends on you showing up fully and strongly, but you're afraid. Uh, so what if you have to face it? And I think that we have to look at that's not really the truth. You have to like put it in perspective. And I think the more people focus on the what ifs and the future, we call it, you know, future negative thinking, that is what uh, reduces your ability to show up in the moment more fully yourself, more fully expressed and in touch with what it is that you have to say in that moment. So what people do is they take themselves out of the present 
because I was saying presence and connection, they take themselves out of the presence, they put themselves into some future kind of scenario where they are not who they want to be, or they have those negative consequences. And then you come back to the present and it you are your effectiveness right there is reduced. So we have to work on, uh, I talked about pattern interrupt, stop that pattern of thinking into the future and coming back to right here, right now, the person in front of you or the group in front of you or the hundreds of people in front of you, uh, what is it there that you, it, what can you do to deliver and be in relation to the people who are listening it's it's uh not such a speaking it's it's more of a listening Mm -hmm. yeah and we have these busy minds right that are just uh so good I, i know a couple of people who tend to be worriers you know they're always envisioning the future they don't want and that's what it sounds like you're really talking about and i think Would you say that the first step is awareness for you to help them even realize that's what they're doing? Yes, I like the phrase you just used, the future, envisioning the future that they don't want. And we know from so many teachers that we create our own reality. So it's like if we're looking out the front door and looking to the right and we see a negative future that's the direction we go our bodies just naturally kind of go to to there because you don't want that to happen but you're so focused on it not happening uh, you you create it or you look out the other direction and you see a positive outcome and I know that sounds so simple yeah think positive (laughs) right But our minds, we can train our minds to do that. And that's the important message I want to deliver today is that our minds, uh, we talk about neuroplasticity and we have little, you know, those chemicals in our brain and uh, we can change them. We can change our thoughts in such a way that uh, we change our future, the vision that you just said of ourselves in in some, some upcoming place where we're speaking. And, you know, as I'm listening to you describe this, what's coming to mind is <clears throat> one of the ways that I would describe what you do is you help people get their power back mm. because they've somehow not even realized they have this power to, to imagine the future they want because their habit is so focused on doing this negative thinking. And so talk a little bit about Uh, maybe give an example of a client that you've helped that came to you with a certain kind of a negative thought about the future or themselves based on past, how you've done a pattern interrupt with them and what a difference that made for them in the way they handled themselves after that. Oh, great. There's so many examples, but of course, the one that comes right to my mind right now is somebody who is a VP of sales. And every Friday at noon, he had to give a report. And when we first started working together, he said that he would sweat for hours all Friday morning. He hated Friday mornings because he had to prepare for this meeting and he would write out his report to his sales team. And then he would show up at the noon meeting and read it. He would read his report. Here he is, the VP of sales. And he knows he knows that about himself, but there was just no other way he could get through it. So uh, so we've worked on it. And um, there is a sense of himself when we did that earlier work uh, as being bullied. He had had early life experience of uh, being teased. He had raised a question in class once and I guess he got laughed at. And so what we did with that, we reframed that moment when he was in the classroom and he identifies as the time when people started to pick on him. He went, oh, I was brave. Do you see it's a reframe rather than the silly guy that people are going to make fun of? It was like, I was really brave. I asked a question nobody else was willing to ask. It was of a sexual nature, I guess, and little kids he, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, so then how then we brought that forward is 
I am brave, you know, identifying a core inside of himself where his strength you talked about, yeah, inside is where the strength is. So he was able to go, I am brave. And then there's another word that he found that he loved about himself that he discovered. And, and it's an affirmation, but it has to have truth. And he said, I am vibrant. So that in going to these meetings, you know, he says, I am brave, I am brave. And of course, we worked on some tools and techniques, the seven secrets that I write about in my book, like how to calm yourself, your body and your mind and how to be present and how to be engaging. I have all these tools, but first we had to uncover the fact that he was still reverberating from being picked on and bullied. And then he had, to, we had to change that into something strong and then how to bring that into his meetings. And it's made all the difference in his life. He writes and says, I am vibrant. Oh. <laughs> it's a whole, a whole new self-concept, see? So it's not so much about speaking. It's about being, being more of who you really are, bringing out the potential inside. And I think for your work with leaders, that that's very important that we have so much more within ourselves to bring to leadership. You know, I, I'm so glad you brought up the being part, because one of the things I loved in your book <clears throat> was each of your, your seven, uh, uh, they're not really, well, I guess they are steps, but, but they work together. So I don't think of them as a sequence <clears throat> as much as elements, maybe, but they all start with the word be. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about why you chose that word as the companion word or the opening word for then the next um, word that was part of that phrase, like be silent. And I want to get into that one, too, because I think that one's so important. Right. Yes. Well, all I, I should say that uh, finally I did realized I was confronted once about my own speaking anxiety. And even though I had a PhD in psychology and a successful private practice, I still hid my anxiety about speaking up and my terror actually. So I know what terror feels like. I know what speaking anxiety feels like. So I know that I went through a process, like I said, I did Toastmasters, but I had to go deeper. So deeper, not only around my self-discovery and patterns, but even deeper, Meredith, to the inner strength, the inner authentic you, the you that is, is so is meant to be here and live out the purpose of why, why you're even brought onto this earth. So uh, the, that's why I go to, that's why all my, my coaching and my process is not about speaking. It's about being, being more of who you are, being more of who you can be and discovering that and developing that from the inside out. So it's not a performance technique. It's really about being. And the first step, as you said, was to be still learning how to Ooh, take that deep, full breath and go to a place inside. And it's a training, an inner presence muscle that you have to develop, a training to find and develop the muscle to be quiet and still. Yes. <clears throat> I, I really want to challenge the folks who are listening to this to think about <clears throat> where, where do you have trouble going deep and uncovering what may be holding you back because I think this is the work that all of us do I know for me it's been a lifelong process I'm still learning I'm still uncovering <clears throat> because I know there's always another level that I can take my being to it's not and I think this is an important point that I'm sure you emphasize with your clients. It's not that we are a shortfall in some way. You know, it's not like we don't measure up when I say, you know, going to another level. It's to me, it's sort of like uncovering what's already there. Like, oh, there's a part over here I hadn't ever recognized or given myself credit for. And the more we can acknowledge our strengths, 
the greater the chance we have of stepping into what I hear you saying is our greatness, you know, the, the reality of who we can really be. And so, you know, we hear the word authentic and, and that's important. I just, I just feel like there's, there's even more in terms of, yes, I want to be real, but I want to be even better than I think I can be because it's all goes back to our stories, right? Our limiting, our current beliefs, whatever they are, are still limiting compared to what they could be. Yes. Yes. I remember interviewing you and uh, you brought such a great insight to finding one's voice is that as we grow, we find new voices that come through us. And I think that's something I want your listeners to to hear today is that it's not just one voice you find it's it's the aspects of all that is possible and the more you grow the more voice you have well let's talk a little bit about the one I know I personally struggle with because I'm sometimes more like a human doing than a human being you know I'm I've got I'm, I'm really good at the action part but the be silent can be challenging at times because it, and part of it, I think is for any of us, there's so much to do. And so we just feel like who has time for that? But I want you to talk about why that is so important. What's the benefit or benefits of taking the time to be silent? What are we being silent for? Yes, uh, we're being silent. There's, if Anybody could Google it, but there's so much in terms of health benefits and uh, the, but where it goes in terms of my work with speaking is that the busy mind that's saying all those negative things about what ifs and you're not going to make it and they're going to judge you. Uh, we have to be able to still those, right? And so that taking your, the awareness that you mentioned and being able to think, quiet your mind, just quiet your mind. Then the physical, the heart that races and the throat that constricts, all the amygdala reactivity that goes on, the unconscious that's coming through, you might say. We have to train our bodies to go down to a quiet clear space and in quiet clear space I can even feel it right now my brain gets a little more spacious uh, the words don't feel so jammed up there's more room for me to breathe and to uh, connect with myself what I'm saying connect with you my listener so that there's so much more than just the busy 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 keep on uh, moving forward. And in a way, it's almost like speak, 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 and never take a pause. You know, taking a breath and pausing is so beautiful in terms of uh, allowing your listeners to take in what you've said to absorb it. Otherwise, it's just shotgun, 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 bullets coming at you. And you just want to pause and just go, oh, I like those words, or I need to ask a question about it. Or uh, So I think that for you, the for those who are listening in leading meetings or giving presentation, being able to train yourself to go to a stillness inside and having your voice come from this place as opposed to the busyness in your head, there isn't a lot of room to think clearly, right? So dropping down gives you much more space to be present and to speak in a way that resonates, you might say, resonates from not just the words, but resonates from this sense of uh, I am present here with you. The withness is so important in speaking. So think about um, your clients and the other of those seven elements. Share another one or two that you find you really need to help them with because they're struggling with it or they're not even aware of the importance of it. This is a big one. Uh, this, is, this is one when I find it's number four in my uh, 
I sometimes call them secrets because it has nothing to do with speaking. It has all the way, all the, it has everything to do with being. But number, this one, number four is be listening. And can you imagine coming to a speaking training and learning how to listen? And I know your, your business is a lot about listening, of course. So how important. And I think you understand that uh, when somebody is speaking in such a way that they're also listening, there's a connection that there's a channel that opens up rather than I'm just speaking at you. I'm speaking with you. And how do I know that you're with me? It's a listening and it's not just listening or are you distracted on your phone or listening and you're got your arms crossed, any kind of body language. It's a deeper kind of, I'm in this still place, I'm present and my voice is coming through, my words are coming through, only I'm listening to you listening to me. And that's the big, I would say that's one of the biggest challenge when people go, well, how do I do that? I'm supposed to be speaking. How do I listen? <laughs> and don't we do that when we're in conversation anyway? Aren't we speaking, listening at the same time? That, that does sound like a paradox, doesn't it? How can you be doing both at the same time? So what do you mean by that? When somebody is speaking, what is it? you want them to pay attention to as a listener as they speak? I want them to, I like the word you just used, pay attention, because lots of times people are so wrapped up in their words or their communication, their script, what they want to get across. They aren't noticing, is the listener really listening? Mm -hmm. just, because, just because they're in the seats does not mean that they are absorbing what you're saying. So it's a, it's more, it might be more of an intuitive sense that I have because, you know, I've spent my years as a psychologist learning how to listen, but that's what I help people learn is how to deepen their listening so that when their speaking comes, the speaking, it's like, all right, I'll just give an example. You, if I have three people in front of me, I notice, I, I imagine that each one has a glass, an empty glass. And I look at them and I notice the empty glass and it's like, oh, there's the listening. They've, they've got an empty listening. And then I speak into the listening. And then I look over at somebody else and I see their empty glass and I go, oh, and you know, it's kind of obviously nonverbal, hello. <laughs> and then I speak into their listening. And so it's, if, if somebody doesn't have the opening and I'm paying attention to them, I'll just move on to somebody else that feels much more I'm able to connect with. So that's, those are some of the ideas about what, what you read in the beginning about presence and connection being present with myself, being present with my listener, connected to myself, my core strength, what we talked about, and connected to you, the listener. And I think a lot of people look at listeners and see the judge rather than the empty glass. And so that's, I'm teaching people how to listen in a deeper sort of way to what's inside, what's, what's good inside of the person, even though they may be judging, but don't let the judge stop you. Go deeper inside of the person and find uh, where they're listening from. And you know, as you're describing that, I was just thinking, how often is it we project onto the other person criticism about us that we're feeling ourselves? Yes. Because if they haven't verbalized any criticism, we can't really know that that's what's going on in their head, but we make assumptions or we project our own feelings, right? Right, and that's what we were talking about before about those thoughts, identifying, well, so what do you think? Exactly, what do you think they're thinking about you? And then we could list those and then we could uh, reframe those. Or I, I also do this deeper work about teaching them how to go straight through those those uh, even if they may be judging or deciding whether or not to buy your product, it's like uh, you got to go through that and reach the human inside of the person, right? And then Do you, you ever, oh, go ahead. Sorry. 
I was just going to say, then you have relationship. You've got a, a, a quali- more of a qualitative relationship with your listener. I was just thinking, do you ever, you're so gentle and, and wonderful. It's hard to imagine you saying this, but do you ever ask them, you know, to ask themselves, well, so what? You know, if, if you're thinking this is what the person is, is thinking about you, do you uh-huh. encourage them to say, well, so what? It's a technique I use. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, for sure, Meredith, it is a technique I use. And then it it is called, so what? And then what? And then what? Okay, so somebody is going to uh, think you're, you're, I don't know, you're a fraud. That's an imposter. And then I go, well, and so what? They are thinking that. Then what? Then they're going to not want to buy my product. And then what? You know, you just take them down as far as you can go. Well, then uh, I guess I'm not worth anything. And then what? <laughs> you know, is and then you get to, is that true? Is that really true that you're not worth anything? You know, how far people can go to where mm-hmm. their uh, insecurity is. So it, it, yes, I do it. It's a technique. Yeah. But I'm sure the way you do it, because of the loving approach you bring to every conversation you have, they um, they don't resist it or they don't get offended by it because you're they know that your motive is to be of help to them in that moment when you're sensing you you need to help them move out of this place that they're in. Right, right. That, yeah, that's that. I think in any kind of coaching, they have to trust us and be willing to let us guide them. And this is one place to help them confront themselves about the truth really Mm -hmm. is it true true that you're gonna melt in front of everybody and disappear no yeah (laughs) i know that's that's one of my favorite takeaways from byron katie you probably are a fan of hers but this is it true do you can you know that it's really true so you challenge your own thoughts and don't necessarily just believe them up front yes So that's tough. Well, I would love to have another example. I loved the one you shared about the vice president of sales and what he went through and how he emerged by going through this process that you helped him with. Just to help my listeners think of different situations where they may be stifling their voice instead of speaking up. What, what, what would be a different example of someone that you've helped in this well, area? I think what you just said is that awareness, are you, I think I would ask your listeners, is there any situation where you feel like you are holding yourself back? And where is that? That would be number one question. That's what I would challenge your listeners. Am I holding myself back? Where is that? And is it, what are the circumstances? So and an example I have of somebody who was just sweating like crazy because he was going to have to go in front of the board and give a report. And of course, they were all authority figures to him. And that was his issue, a father who, <laughs> an authoritarian father who early on had, uh, you know, had to make sure he was uh, getting the grades and achieving and pushing and pressuring. And so he incorporated all that kind of pressure inside of himself so that when this high, you know, it was really high stakes to go into a boardroom where there were in his mind, higher ups, of course, that uh, had more authority, he was able to um, look at that and connect it with his his issues around authority. And so I think that a lot of times in terms of businesses, that issue comes up a lot around, uh, I don't want to raise my hand or I don't want to give a report or I don't because the boss is in the room, you know, and the boss is like this scary wizard. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and you know the work has to be take the take the cloak off the wizard and just say he's just another human being he's just a little boy or a little girl who had her own issues so uh, you know or look for the good or the essence inside of them uh, so it, i think that's one of the most challenging 
in terms of businesses, having people see that uh, they have value and what they say is um, going to make a contribution and that even if they're being judged by a boss, it feels like they can be more, um, they could listen, learn to listen to this human being called boss <laughs> and uh, connect and, and have a relationship, a real relationship, human to human at the right level, as opposed to a hierarchy level. Hmm. Lots of wisdom in there, mm -hmm. uh, Doreen, with what you just said, it, because I think it all goes back again to the stories we have about someone else as opposed to the reality. We, yeah. we can uh, give away our power to someone else and not even realize it. So I love the work that you're doing to raise the awareness, to help people recognize their own power, their own abilities that they may have minimized or even denied in the past. Well, before we wrap up and I ask you to share where uh, people can connect with you. Is there anything else that I haven't asked you about that you would really like to convey to my listeners? Well, what you just said about how we get trapped in our beliefs, we didn't use that word today, but that is, uh, it has to do with self-concept, I guess, or how we come to identify who we are. And I think that for those of us who want to grow in our businesses, uh, we need to be able to challenge, to be willing to be challenged. You're a fabulous coach. I know that. And find a coach that will help you uh, become more self-aware and to develop what's the potential inside of you. Well, you, you're amazing, Doreen. I'm not even a paid professional coach. You know, I just help <laughs> people along the way uh, as I encounter situations with them. Um, but, but you really are. You embody this wonderful professional with all of the wonderful background you have that you bring to these situations. And I know that Many of my listeners, I think, will probably have that same feeling that I have every time we've talked. There is this reassurance about your, in your presence, uh, calming um, and, and, and non-judgmental. There's a very, you know, wonderful accepting spirit that you have that when you challenge someone, it isn't in a threatening way, it is as a guide to help them. And so I know many of my listeners are going to want to connect with you and learn more about your work. So tell them where they can find you and get um, more information about your resources and your services. Yes, well, you mentioned the seven steps and that they really are elements or secrets, but I have a, a link that I think people could get instantly uh, what these seven, all seven secrets are and or steps. And it's called Doreen seven steps.com. And you spell my name Doreen D-O-R-E-E-N seven steps.com. And I think that's a quick way to get on my mailing list and get the uh, seven secret seven step guide. And the next, I do have a group coming up, a coaching group this fall. I know that this podcast will probably come out afterwards, but I do them several times a year. It's a three-month training program to do exactly what we've been talking about today, finding uh, your voice and learning how to calm yourself, your mind, your body, and have clarity and confidence to be who you truly are in this world and offer your gift. And so what's your website where they can learn more about that? Yeah, essentialspeaking.com, essentialspeaking.com. And of course, I have the podcast website, which I modeled after your website and podcast is findyourvoicechangeyourlife.com. And I invite, you know, somebody who's listening to us today has a story that they want to tell about their own history about not having a voice and their journey to find it and what they can do now, given that they have a voice. I'd love to have them be a guest on my podcast. Excellent. Well, 
those who have listened to you know what a great experience that would be to be a guest. And I encourage everyone to pick up this guide that Doreen is making available to you. And Doreen, I just want to thank you so much for being my guest today and also just who you are in the world. We need positive presence like you have to really have a a wonderful impact and help people move from their beliefs, their stories into the person they're really capable of. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Well, thank you too, Meredith, for all of what you do to support us out there. Thank you.